Well, how do there, Charms Design, Captain of the Stews, and I'm being joined by a cup of tea that's slowly going to get demolished during this episode of Dragon's Dogma 2. I've got some new news for you. I say new news, I've got two new videos to go over, both of them dropped by IGN. So let's jump on over to the old Tinter web, shall we? And let's bring them up on screen. There's two to go through. We've got the Trickster Vocation Breakdown, and we've also got the Sphinx, yes, as an enemy, like a boss-type enemy. Anyway, I'm going to jump in to do the, the actual pro... Uh, this one first, the vocation. So let's jump on in and let's take a quick look at it, shall we, people? Make it a bit larger on the old screen. Dragon's Dogma 2 offers a wide variety of playstyles depending on what vocation you select. Most of these are the kinds of archetypes that you'd expect. Melee sword fighter, speedy dagger-wielding thief, ranged archer, and spell-slinging mage. And some are hybrid vocations, like Mystic Spearhand and Magic Archer, that combine elements of one vocation with another for a completely new style of play. But what of the Trickster vocation? It was revealed as part of the Dragon's Dogma 2 showcase back in November, but little has been shown of this unique class beyond that quick 45 second look and a short description on the Dragon's Dogma 2 website. I'm not gonna lie, out of all the, pro the vocations that you can have in this game, this one intrigues me the most, but at the same time it's probably the one that I'm going to avoid. It looks greatly underpowered, it looks more like a support class, but let's just uh, carry on. Fortunately, as part of our visit to Capcom, we got to sit down and play with the Trickster for about an hour. And I can confidently say that this is a style of gameplay unlike anything I've ever seen in an open world action game. I do like the IGN firsts. I love them when they did them for start, No Man's Sky. The Trickster is essentially a pacifist. Their chosen yeah. weapon, a ceremonial sensor, does little to no damage when it's swung at an enemy. Instead, yeah. the purpose of attacking is to build up aggro and pull an enemy's attention towards you. To that end, you also have a special ability called Suffocating Shroud that sends out your smoke in a wide area and draws a large amount of enemy attention towards you. So, the question is, why would you want to get a whole group of enemies swarming on you if you can't actually damage them? Ah, see, that's where the word Trickster comes into play. By using the Trickster's unique skill, Effigial Incense, you create a simulacra, or a clone, for simplicity's sake, that enemies will perceive as the real you. This clone has its own health bar and will disappear if it's killed, but you can also teleport the clone to you while it's still alive with the press of a button. This way, you can basically kite enemies to wherever you want, as long as you keep their aggro and keep your clone alive. It's a bit like using the old ghost bell inside of Elden Ring then, to a degree. Um, apart from the ghosts that you summon, don't really do a great deal. Okay, so I'd imagine this is more for environmental damage and being more around, uh, aware of your surroundings which I can only see useful at certain points in the game. Otherwise, you're just going to be flailing around with mist everywhere. So, you can maneuver a foe to get an environmental advantage, which is super important because the trickster shines the brightest when there are cliffs, uneven surfaces, or other elements of the yeah. environment that can be used to your advantage. The trickster has two abilities designed around creating surfaces that aren't really there, but appear real to enemies. The first, Tricky Terrace, creates a cloud that can be placed off a ledge that the enemy will perceive as real solid ground. And the second, Elusive Divider, will create a wall of smoke that you can see through, but the enemy cannot. The final piece of this puzzle is the Visitant Aura, a technique that essentially allows you to make an astral projection oh, like that. that you can freely move around to scout the landscape for as long as your stamina will allow. You're super vulnerable while controlling the projection, so using Elusive Divider to give yourself some cover while using it in the heat of battle is a good idea. Crucially, you can float off ledges, ascend or descend at will, and even call your clone to wherever your projection currently is. I'm sure you can probably see why that might be useful. When you combine all of these tricks together, the real value of the trickster comes into view. Before getting into a combat encounter, you can create a clone with effigial incense, use Visitant Aura to scout out an area for enemies and look for any sort of environmental hazards, like a cliff for instance, recall your clone so that it hovers over said environmental hazard, place a false floor underneath it with Tricky Terrace, then lure enemies close to the clone and use Suffocating Shroud to send all their aggro towards the clone, and then watch with glee as enemies throw themselves off the ledge in effort to get at you. 
this feels like a Harry Potter class or something. It's it's a little bit freaking insane the amount of setup you've got to go through just to deliver death by watching them jump off a cliff, like lemmings. It could be quite fun. I'd imagine this would be a good class to actually use if you've got some very beefy pawns with you, like your mates are like max leveled and you just want to have a bit of fun while you're watching them tear it up. Uh, I, I suppose maybe I don't think I'll be trying this class on very hard mode, but on easy mode, perhaps maybe or normal. I don't know. Now, obviously, this is a lot of prep to go through, and it isn't going to be practical in every single situation, which is why the Trickster is also equipped with some other tricks up their sleeves. Okay. First and foremost, they are a support class, relying on and substantially buffing the strength of their pawn party so that they can do most of the heavy lifting. One yeah, such buff okay. is Aromatic Resurgence which supercharges your party, making them hit a lot harder. Sweet. While I was playing for gameplay capture reasons, I had to make a mental note not to use this buff because my pawns would kill all my foes before I got a chance to show off any of the more technical tricks of the vocation. The most powerful spell I saw of the tricksters was Dragon's Delusion, which takes some time to cast, but brings forth an illusion of a dragon that terrifies any enemy that sees it, even Pretty large ogres, Pretty nice. bringing them down to their knees giving your pawns ample opportunity to do big damage. Since most of the Trickster's other skills seemed well suited for dealing with small to mid-sized enemies, this was a really nice addition to see as something that could also let them deal with the bigger and badder enemies. Okay. Trickster was not an easy vocation to figure out in just an hour's time. It took me a little while to fully grasp the aggro system, avoiding pulling too much aggro and not having a way to get away from the enemies I just attracted, but once it clicked, I found it to be a uniquely satisfying vocation that brought to mind one of the core tenets of Devil May Cry's combat. It's not just about killing every enemy in the room, but how you kill every enemy in the room. It's an intentionally underpowered vocation mm. that's designed to encourage creative thinking, to solve difficult combat problems in ways beyond just swinging a weapon or hurling a tornado at it and it's one that I'm very excited to experiment more with once I've got my hands on the full game. Thanks for watching, and this is just the beginning of our IGN first coverage of Dragon... Okay, well, actually, I would imagine that's going to make me want to play through again and maybe play through the full game on that one vocation just to see how I do. Now, when I pick up Dragon's Dogma, when I, when I picked up the first one, I played through on easy mode just so I got all the story and understood the quests and what happens in what order and all that sort of shenanigans. And then I played it through on normal mode and I tried a completely different vocation. Then I jumped to a super hard mode. I actually platinumed the game, but I completed it three times and each time I got different endings. So I'm hoping Dragon's Dogma 2 is very similar in style and I think I'll probably play it in exactly the same way. Very easy mode for the story, then in normal mode to get an idea of what the game should be like, and then super hard mode to see if I can get all the trophies. That's what I'm thinking anyway, people. Anyway, Dragon's Dogma 2, get to know the Sphinx. So here we go, let's hit this up. Let's have a look at this one. This is your choice. The greatest worth your eyes describe. Interesting choice of voice. Mm. Okay, right, so I think a lot of the actual speaking in this is in Japanese. We have got the subtitles down at the bottom, but what I'm tempted to do is turn the sound right down and read those sort of statements from these chaps. So here we go, let's do that. Okay. The Sphinx was one of the monsters I most wanted to add to the game. The Sphinx is all about riddles, right? I wanted players to solve the Sphinx's riddles, but through action, as this is an action game. Sweet. Yeah. We came up with lots of ideas for riddles, solved through action gameplay. I hope players look forward to getting to do just that. It really is something unique. It's detailed facial expressions when you're solving a riddle, for example. Okay, that's creepy as fudge. That's... When you're talking to it and decide on an answer. It takes a look at the player, like, are you really sure? 
That's what I wanted to do. Well, that's freaky, mate. It's so creepy that it causes you to think that you're really in a battle of wits against it. Oh, all those chests. We put a lot of work into that. IGN's player did answer the riddle correctly today. But it's all over if you answer wrong. <laughs> cool. That's the scary thing about Dragon's Dogma. Oh. Yeah, we laughed. Oh man, there's a massive chest there. Whether or not you can defeat or even fight the Sphinx is a riddle too. Okay. We'd like that it'd be part of the fun players have dealing with the things and it's a riddles. The journey to finding it might actually be the biggest mystery of all. Seriously. Meanwhile, even though the Sphinx is one of this game's featured attractions, it has nothing to do with the progression of the main game. It really doesn't. Well, maybe nothing at all. Seriously. It's just like a side quest, just a little pigeonhole, is it? Brilliant. How do I even put it? It's such a special part of the game, but exists way off in its own corner. There's a lot of other large monsters like that too. Oh man. We can't go into too much detail, but we've really gone all out. I imagine there will be a lot of players who beat the game without even encountering the Sphinx. <laughs> the map is just so big, and while there is a level of design with places we want players to go in certain order, there's still characters placed all the way off in a corner. <laughs> I think it's something so unique to the open world games. Yes, it's not just the things. Okay. We've made a lot of players don't necessarily need to find, but we'd be incredibly moved if they do find it. There's so much, that's the key. Is there a part of the game that you know you don't have to discover? You can beat it without even finding them. It's just so, it's such an extravagant waste. It is, but it's something we've done quite a lot. Yes, there's a good bit that you won't be able to get unless you head out there yourself to get it. A lot of times players may wonder if there is something the game doesn't have, only for our reaction to be, actually, it does. Oh, the Sphinx, I definitely need to find the Sphinx inside of this game. Man, I'm loving that idea that some players might not even come across the Sphinx. That's, that's insane to think. Awesome. Anyway, people, that's pretty much everything I've got for you. It's just those two videos that IGN have put out as the IGN first, other than the professions one that I've already covered off, the basic sort of vocations. If you haven't seen that one, it's pretty good. I'll put a link in the top corner over there. Go hit that one up. Yeah, go watch that video, and that'll show you most of the basic professions, like the warrior class, and it shows a bit of sorcery in there as well. The thief class, and there's one other in there. Yeah, go check it out. I'm fairly sure you're going to be fairly impressed with that one. It was pretty darn lovely. You get to see them take out a couple of giant trolls and ogres and things. And it, or cyclops, one or the other. Anyway, people, salute to Mondo, and uh, thank you for watching. And I'll see you all again soon. And uh, Dragon's Dogma 2, you can pre-order it right now. There's two bundles available on the PSN store. And it's coming out in March, on the 22nd of March. So be sure to pencil that one into your calendars. It's definitely going to be in mine. I'm actually contemplating booking a day off work for it, people inside the view of us. Anyway, until next time, goodbye, goodbye. And goodbye again.